So hi, welcome back. The topic of today's lecture is knowledge, justification, and argument. As I've been emphasizing over the last few days, human beings are unique in the animal kingdom uh, in our epistemic cooperation. Uh, so alone among the animals, we share what we know, and we do this interactively. Other animals can share what they know, but not in an interactive way. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're constantly updating not only each other's pictures of the world, um, that's something that maybe bees can do as well. But we're also updating each other's pictures of who knows what, uh, of the epistemic territory, the epistemic gradient between us. Um, still, it's one thing to have knowledge, and it's another thing to share it. Um, the connection between possession and transmission is tricky in a couple of ways. First, because we can have knowledge, which is actually very difficult to share with other people. Uh, and secondly, because Sometimes what we're sharing with other people isn't knowledge. Uh, and it, this happens not only in cases of deliberate deception, uh, where I know that the truth is P, but I manage to share to you the idea that not P, um, but also in cases of being accidentally uh, wrong about something, innocently mistaken. I can take myself to know something uh, and tell you, and you can perhaps even buy what I'm selling. Uh, and that's obviously something suboptimal. If we had perfect knowledge attributing capacities, we would not be subject to these problems, right? Um, we would always be able to tell whether a speaker did or did not have knowledge of what they were telling us. Uh, and we would also uh, be able to communicate effortlessly with others, anything um, private that we, did, uh, that we did happen to know, right? Um, so our knowledge, our knowledge attribution mechanisms are, of course, not perfect. Um, they are adapted, but imperfectly adapted uh, to the task of sharing knowledge. Uh, and today I'm particularly interested in the imperfections of our knowledge attributing capacities. Um, so I'm interested in the limits uh, that we have when we go uh, about sharing knowledge, because it's exactly in the task of sharing knowledge that our knowledge attributing capacities are most often called into play uh, as epistemically cooperative animals. And I think those limits of our knowledge attributing capacities are especially important uh, for epistemologists who want to know whether they can trust an intuitive sense that someone either has or lacks knowledge. Because the uh, intuitive knowledge attributions we make when we think about particular hypothetical or actual cases are arising from these natural mechanisms that we have within us uh, for the detection of knowledge. OK, I distinguish, as you see uh, in point two on your handout, between four basic types of knowledge. Uh, so we have interoceptive knowledge, uh, which is your knowledge of your own uh, private subjective inner states, such as a feeling of nausea or dizziness uh, or joy, even. Um, and then we have perceptual knowledge, which is knowledge of our shared outer reality. Uh, we have testimonial knowledge, which is transmitted from other people. And lastly, we have infer inferential knowledge. Um, I have a number of reasons why I make this fourfold division in types of knowledge. Um, one is that it's a division that you see marked in very similar ways. Uh, in a number of different uh, historical philosophical traditions. Um, so you see a, a set of distinctions very much like this in uh, classical Indian philosophy. You also see it in classical Western philosophy, medieval Western philosophy. You'll see it in thinkers like Augustine. Um, you see it in some way in the early modern period as well. So, this, so these are a set of distinctions that uh, epistemologists have uh, have historically converged on to some extent. Some of you may be surprised not to see memory in the list. Uh, and I have several reasons for that. My first reason is actually that memory is involved in absolutely all judgments, um, including judgments of you know, very, very immediate questions of what you seem to feel right now uh, in order to classify a certain sensation uh, as nausea or a certain color. Uh, as I'm looking around for an uncontroversial case of color, and I can't decide if this is orange or red, so it's like a bad example. A certain color is white. 
um, to take an example from the Theotetus, you have to have uh, some memory for that, uh, for that classification. Um, so I think memory is sort of pervasive throughout these. And memory on its own, sheer memory, um, doesn't give you anything. Memory gives you something if you combine it uh, with our other powers of knowing, uh, such as perception, testimony, or inference. You remember what you have seen. You remember a conclusion that you have argued for. Um, so, so memory on its own uh, supports all the rest and isn't a freestanding thing uh, all by itself. There's another reason why I like this fourfold division, and, that's, and this is that it maps on uh, very neatly to a set of distinctions that are marked uh, in many natural languages around the world. Uh, so roughly 25% of the world's roughly 6,000 languages have obligatory grammatical morphology indicating the source of one's evidence. Uh, so in English, I can say, John was at the party last night. Uh, and I can leave it really an open question whether I saw him there, whether I heard from someone else that he was there, or whether, um, you know, having looked at all the evidence of the destruction the morning after, I gathered that John must have been at the party. Um, in many languages in the world, you can't be ambiguous in that way. Uh, when you make a statement, you have to give some marking of whether this is based on your first-hand knowledge you heard from someone else uh, or you uh, gain knowledge of it through, uh, through inference or whether it's uh, something that you had uh, private inner awareness of, uh, the way that you could be aware of a state of, uh, a state of nausea uh, or something like that. So in the Tibetan language, for example, you are obliged to use markers of one or the other of these ways of knowing. Um, not all languages with obligatory evidentials mark exactly this fourfold division, but the fourfold division um, is, uh, is, in some way, uh, is in some way foundational. So there's a lot of languages that just draw a line between the first two and the last two. So interoceptive and perceptual on the one hand, and testimonial and inferential on the other. Um, so there's the more direct and more indirect ways of knowing. Um, and you'll notice that even if you speak like a language like English, which doesn't have these obligatory markings, it's still possible. It's lexical and it's optional, but it's possible to mark these divisions. Like I can say, apparently John was at the party. And that makes it clear to you that I didn't see him there myself, right? Or I have other ways of speaking that might indicate that I did see something directly. Um, the distinction between these different ways of knowing is a distinction that um, isn't, isn't, is an interesting sense. It's, it's, it's learned for us uh, as, as, as we develop as children. If you take very small children, they're often unaware of how it is that they got to know something. So, um, so you know, three-year-olds, you can either show them that the candy is in the box, or you can tell them that the candy is in the box. What they'll take away from this is that the candy is in that box, uh, and they may be very unreliable reporters at age three of whether they know this because they saw or because they were told. We get very good at tracking those distinctions as adults. And there's evidence that we actually track them, uh, whether or not we speak a language that makes it mandatory for us to report them. Um, so just as in, as, as in tense markings, uh, not all languages make it obligatory for finite clauses to mark tense, to mark time of occurrence, whether it's present, past, or future. Um, there's languages where that is lexical and optional. And you can, if you want to disambiguate, throw in some expression. Uh, uh, you know, it, the, it's as if the core meaning of the sentence is just something like John at party. And you can throw in the word tonight or last night. Um, to indicate uh, where, where that happened in time, but you don't have to. In languages like that, it's usually pretty clear from context whether the party was last night or tonight. Um, and, uh, and even if you do have a language that doesn't force you to express temporal position of an event, uh, as a matter of psychological fact, 
we register temporal position of an, of an event, and we can report on it if we need to. So also with evidential markings, even if we speak a language that doesn't force you to disclose them, you do register. You register something about your position with respect to the fact um, that you either know or take yourself to know. Um, we're not infallible in this. Sometimes we think we've seen something that actually we didn't see. Um, but it's something that accompanies our judgment. So there's something very different about a party that you just heard about and a party that you actually attended. You feel that difference uh, in thinking about these, uh, in thinking about these events. Um, this set of distinctions has been argued by Margaret Spees to have a uh, essentially social function for us. So why is it important for us to track not just where the candy is, but whether we came to know that the candy was there by seeing it or by hearing about it for, from a third party? You might think it's kind of weird that we obligatorily track that distinction. Spies has argued um, we track it uh, because it matters to us where our knowledge is coming to relative to uh, other people around us. So interoceptive knowledge is coming from a source uh, that in principle you don't have immediate access to. Whether right now I'm feeling tired or alert or nauseous is something that I can see in a way that you can't. Um, if we're talking about a fact in the zone of perception, my awareness that this water bottle is right here is something that is out in the public between us and you could share. Testimonial knowledge is knowledge that's coming from outside um, the immediate sphere of this, uh, of this conversation, if I'm reporting it to you. That's the natural home for it. Um, and inferential knowledge actually combines uh, elements of the other types of knowledge with awareness on my part of, uh, of an inner trajectory of inference. So Spies has argued there's a kind of social function being served here. Um, and that's another thing that might be ultimately uh, a clue to why we distinguish these um, types of knowledge. And I could say more about that in question period if you're curious about the details of the theory. OK, so if you think those are the basic types of knowledge, um, you'll notice that there's some interesting asymmetries between how you can transfer uh, knowledge of the different types. I'm not going to speak here about transmission of interoceptive knowledge, um, but I think uh, there is a long history of recognizing that there's something weird and interesting and problematic about it. So I have my own inner private feeling of joy or dizziness. Um, there, might, there are some very interesting questions about how, if at all, I could possibly share that with another person, because it's a private subjective state of mind. It's not a fact like the fact of this uh, water bottle being, uh, being on the table. I'm going to set interoceptive knowledge aside. Um, for the time being, and focus on the other types of knowledge. Um, so notice, um, with perceptual knowledge, if I want to give you perceptual knowledge of the fact, one of the ways in which I can do this um, is by drawing your perceptual attention to the fact. Look at that water bottle. It's over there, right? And then uh, I have shared my knowledge with you, but I've shared it by triggering your own exercise of your own perceptual faculties. So you get not only the fact that the water bottle is on the table as an item of knowledge now, um, but you get your own independent, perceptually grounded knowledge of that, uh, of that fact. And actually, notice, I can direct your perceptual attention to a fact that I don't even know myself. I can accidentally like point to something or reveal something. And I'm not even looking that way, but you end up looking that way and discovering something, seeing inside the box, whatever. So I don't have to know that P is true in order for me, interestingly, to share or to give you or to trigger in you knowledge that P is true by directing your perceptual attention um, towards the fact or event that P. OK, how about, um, how about testimonial knowledge? I can give you testimonial knowledge that something is the case by telling you that it's the case. Um, so I could give you uh, knowledge that my mother's middle name was Louise by just telling you this. Um, now, are you going to actually gain knowledge of the fact that my mother's middle name was Louise just by hearing it from me? 
only if you see me as knowing um, that her name was, uh, was Louise. Um, there are some philosophers who think that you can gain testimonial knowledge from a speaker who doesn't know the key fact herself. Uh, so uh, Jennifer Lackey has a wonderful example of a high school biology teacher who is personally a Christian and a creationist. Um, but because of the terms of her contract and her sense of professional duty, uh, she goes right ahead and teaches her class all about um, the theory of chance variation and natural selection, according to which human beings have common ancestors with um, other primates. And Lackey says, OK, here's a case in which uh, the teacher doesn't herself believe, let alone know, that human beings have common ancestors with other primates, but she might nevertheless succeed in transmitting uh, to her class knowledge of that very fact. Uh, and I think this is a really interesting, fascinating example. But I'm actually not convinced that what you have there is testimonial knowledge transmission. I think one of two things could be happening. One of the things that might be happening is that the teacher is actually, in the course of teaching, presenting the class with what is, in fact, a sound argument for the conclusion that human beings have common ancestors with other primates. Uh, and if she's doing that, then the class isn't getting testimonial knowledge in which you take another person's word for it. What they're getting is inferential knowledge. They're going through the argument seeing that the conclusion follows. Um, Another thing that might be happening is actually a different kind of inferential knowledge. Maybe the students are blessed to be in a classroom where the teachers ordinarily uh, and very safely report to them only things that are true. And they are essentially inferring from her role as teacher at the front of the class. Uh, and they're experiencing an educational system where teachers can be trusted to deliver the truth. Um, they are. Uh, taking her word for it on the basis of her authority as teacher, on the basis of her occupation of a, in a role uh, where, uh, where the truth is told by people in that role. Uh, and that's not exactly the same as uh, taking someone's word for it in the ordinary case of testimonial knowledge transmission. So I think uh, I'm going to disagree with Lackey. Um, usually when you take someone's word for it in testimony, it's because you see them as saying something that is within their epistemic territory. It's within the zone of things that uh, you're going to trust them on. Uh, you ask if they'll be free for lunch. They say yes or no. Uh, and you learn, you update, uh, you gain knowledge from testimony uh, on that point um, because you've seen them as knowing the answer to that question even before you asked. And in fact, that was why you asked. You were searching for answer from them, for knowledge from them on that, on that point. Lastly, uh, the speaker can give the hearer inferential knowledge that P is the case by presenting the hearer with a sound, explicit argument um, that P is the case. Uh, and this is true even if S didn't originally learn that P through inference. Um, so maybe I saw something, which is actually really very surprising, uh, and I tell you about it. You don't believe me at first, uh, but then I can give you maybe an argument um, that this is really something that happens because I'm aware of uh, supporting considerations which actually back up what I'm saying. So this is another thing that we can do. And notice, just like the first case where when I direct your perceptual attention um, towards something, like towards this green light over here, and you look at it and you register that the light is green, you got your own independent knowledge at that point of the light being green. You didn't have to take my word for it. So also with inferential reasoning, if I present you an argument for something, um, like the argument that there's no greatest prime number, you walk away from this exchange with your own independent uh, knowledge of that conclusion grounded for you uh, in that sound, explicit argument. Um, assuming, of course, yeah, assuming, of course, you have knowledge uh, of the premises, which let's, let's, say, let's say that you do. Uh, so, so in uh, inferential knowledge transmission, again, I can give you your own independent way of knowing a conclusion. And I can do that, uh, even if the conclusion is something that I don't myself know. 
I could unwittingly demonstrate to you uh, that P is the case, even if I don't know that P. Um, so, uh, so for example, maybe I'm a detective trying to solve a crime, and I say, oh, you know what, well, hypothetically, and I go through some reasoning, and one of the, one of the premises in my reasoning is, uh, you know, well, what if, um, you know, uh, John actually did tell Henry uh, where the gun was or something like that. Suppose I'm going through this reasoning, and for me it's just, that premise is just a point of speculation, um, but you know, one of the people listening to my argument is Henry himself, who knows that that point is true, and then realizes what actually happened. And for that person, uh, knowledge of a conclusion could, uh, could follow, even if I, as the speculating detective, I don't have knowledge of a conclusion, right? What matters is that the argument has premises which are in fact true uh, and which are known by the hearer to be true uh, and that the argument structure is actually a valid one. Uh, St. Augustine has a really beautiful example of this with the Epicurean who uh, denies the existence of God, of course, um, is just about pleasure as an Epicurean. Um, but this Epicurean, one of the things he finds pleasure in is, um, you know, rehearsing great arguments. Uh, he enjoys he enjoys rhetoric and argumentation for its own sake. So one day he's you know walking through the marketplace, reciting out loud, rehearsing some argument for the existence of God, which of course, unbeknownst to the Epicurean, this is actually a sound argument, says Augustine, and someone's listening to him in the marketplace, and it's like, oh, wow, yeah, OK, God exists, right? Um, and that person, according to Augustine, can gain knowledge of uh, God's existence through hearing this argument, even from a non-believer. Um, so notice, in transmissions of type 1 and 3, that's perceptual and inferential transmission, you don't have to have uh, knowledge as a speaker or as a sharer uh, in order to give knowledge. Um, and you don't have to be perceived as knowing in order to give knowledge. It's only when I'm just trying to tell you something that I'm going to want you to see me as knowing uh, in order for you to take my word for it um, in ordinary testimonial transmission. Okay, so, um, so notice, okay, this is uh, point number four. Uh, the easy cases of knowledge transmission from when I'm just telling you something um, are cases where I already see you um, as knowing the answer to a given question of mine as I'm asking it. Are you free for lunch? Uh, yeah, oh great, okay. And I'll give you that little marker that yeah, I've got, I've got knowledge from you now. I just add your answer immediately to the stock of what I, of what I know because I took you to be knowing the answer to the question. Before I asked you, that was why I asked you. Um, it'd be really weird to, for me to ask you, are you free for lunch today? And you say, yeah. And I say, no, you're not. Um, that would actually, or, or prove it to me, right? That would actually show that that initial question that I asked, are you free for lunch today, was actually a kind of pedagogical question. I was trying to catch you, gotcha, right? I was trying to catch you out. It wasn't. Uh, the kind of question we ordinarily ask each other, which is a, a knowledge, uh, a knowledge-seeking question, it was a different, different kind of move I was making there. Harder cases of knowledge transmission um, often invoke uh, explicit re reasoning or argument, so it can play an absolutely crucial role. So if I, as a hearer, am in doubt about whether or not a speaker actually does possess knowledge on a given point, they say something, and I'm like, actually, I'm not sure that you know that that's true. Maybe I'm worried that you're lying. Maybe I'm worried that you're innocently mistaken. Maybe I'm just like, I don't know if I want to take that on board. I'm not sure that what you're saying is true. I can challenge you uh, to provide reasons. And this is, again, even if your original argument wasn't founded on explicit reasoning or argumentation. What I'm doing if I do that is I'm essentially forcing you, I'm switching you from type 2 knowledge transmission, where it's just to take my word for it, testimonial exchange, to type 3 transmission, where there's explicit argumentation going on. Um, and that kind of challenging and switching is apparently cross-culturally uh, universal. It helps be a, a solution to the problem of cheap signaling, uh, as we talked about the last time. 
So we can also, so, th so that, that argumentation structure is something that we engage in specifically when we're worried about epistemic status. We can also become self-conscious about our own epistemic status, challenging ourselves. Wait a minute, do I really know this? Uh, and then instinctively produce an explicit argument for ourselves just as we would for other people. Um, but here's a question. What do arguments like that really reveal when you, when you challenge yourself? Wait, do I really know this? Then you start coming up with an argument. What do they really reveal? For a lot of internalists in, about epistemic justification, arguments like that reveal the true nature of epistemic justification. I'm going to take a rather extreme case here, which is Steve Schiffer. Um, who talks about formation of perceptual belief and justification of perceptual belief as follows. Uh, he has an example in which there's some uncontroversial uh, empirical proposition, like there's a red cube in front of me right now, um, lighting is normal, vision is great, um, and he abbreviates that um, proposition as cube. Uh, and he's talking about what goes on in the good case, in the favorable case, where there really is a cube uh, and everything's cool. Uh, he describes justification as, in those cases as follows. I'm quoting. In good, the good case, I come to be justified in believing cube, that there's this cube in front of me, by inferring it from the fact that I am having such and such sensory experiences as of cube, and I cannot become justified in believing cube other than by inferring it from such evidence. OK, so my first kind of worry about that is, wait a minute. Uh, in the good case, we actually see something. Do you really infer from, OK, so I infer from, oh, I'm now having sensory experiences as of a water bottle that there is a water bottle there, right? Like, we certainly don't go through any kind of explicit reasoning um, on that point. Uh, and so there's something, and there's also something kind of funny about this locution of having experiences as of cube or experiences as of the water bottle, right? It's an old point that Barclay makes a lot of other people in. Actually, you can go back all the way, if you flip over your handout to Ajatakara um, in the seventh century um, of Common Era. Uh, that those as of locutions seem a little bit derivative, right? Like, what would it be like to have experiences, oh, just like the ones you have when you're looking at a water bottle, um, if you didn't have a prior grasp of uh, looking at a water bottle, right? Um, it seems, uh, seems to be something a little, uh, a little bit strange about that. Um, but internalists often, not always, have that kind of fundamentally inferential uh, story about what justifies their belief. I'm going to be arguing that that story is generated by certain demands on sharing contested beliefs. It's not generated by the underlying epistemic structure of the situation. By contrast, externalists like Timothy Williamson, this is eight on your handout, don't see justified belief as ultimately inferential in character. They don't take knowledge to be always based on evidence. Um, they really emphasize in perception, we're actually engaged in unreflective thinking. I am immediately aware of the water bottle. That's the first thing I'm aware of. Uh, I'm not like first aware of my own private inner experiences and then I infer, oh ho, there's a water bottle out there. Um, so he says, this is Williamson, when we acquire new evidence in perception, we don't first acquire unknown evidence and then somehow base knowledge on it later. Rather, acquiring new evidence is acquiring new knowledge. Um, so he has his general formula that knowledge equals evidence. Those are the same thing. Um, that knowledge, so perceptual knowledge, doesn't have to itself be based on further evidence. So your perceptual knowledge that there is a water bottle right here doesn't have to be based on evidence that uh, you, evidence like I have inner seemings as of a water bottle. It's not based on any evidence at all. Uh, it is evidence, which you've just gained from your perceptual systems. It's not based on anything that you're first conscious of before you're aware of the outer object. Um, OK, on this kind of view, you're not initially aware of these visual appearances. You're just initially aware of the outer object. Um, and uh, what, then you can ask, OK, so if there isn't that inferential structure, what is it that's making perceptual uh, beliefs justified? And here Williamson thinks it's, um, uh, it's something like the manner of their generation, right? So 
uh, let's say, within an externalist framework, you've got these sensory systems which are designed to give you, or which give you an appropriate causal sensitivity um, to a range of facts. There's some fact that P within that range uh, that's causing you to judge that P is the case through the operation of these systems. Um, that larger causal story is what justifies your judgment. Uh, in the sense of making it right, making it normatively OK, making it appropriate, uh, actually making it knowledge in the, in the good case. Um, that big causal story itself isn't something that you consciously register. You don't consciously register the operations in your visual cortex, which are supporting the production of your judgment. You consciously register the outer world fact about the object, not the whole causal chain uh, linking you to the thing. Sometimes justification of a belief does rest on a basis with some crucial consciously accessible components. Like when you're forming a belief through explicit inference, you have to be consciously aware of the premises. You're reciting them in your speech, you're looking at them on the blackboard, something like that. Even in those cases, what you're conscious of is just a small part of the justifying basis of the belief that you form. Um, the whole basis involves the whole causal history, which incorporates a lot of subpersonal inferential mechanisms, which could be doing things like performing logical operations. You're not necessarily conscious of exactly what those log logical operations are. Um, you're conscious of the premises. You're conscious of the conclusions. Uh, and in cases where you're justified, uh, the argumentative structure is, in fact, a sound one. OK. Um, so now we're going to get into my infallibilism uh, and my externalism. So this is uh, point 10 on your handout. Uh, what is the justifying basis of what's known? Uh, so if you take knowing to be distinguished from believing by its special relationship with the truth, so it's an essential feature of knowledge that only what's true can be known. Ways of knowing are most naturally distinguished from the broader class of ways of believing in virtue of their relationship to the truth. So in my view, a way of judging that P uh, is a way of knowing only if, um, that's a necessary but not sufficient condition, only if the truth of P is essential to this way of judging. Uh, on this way of individuating ways of knowing, inference on its own isn't a way of knowing. Sound inference from known premises is. It's a feature of sound inference from known premises. Um, that the truth of what you're concluding is essential to that process. So likewise, perception counts as a way of knowing only if it's understood in success terms, as involving an appropriate causal relationship between an actual object or event uh, and a corresponding judgment. Sometimes people will use perception in a more neutral way um, to allow uh, you know, sensory illusion or hallucination to count as species of perception. Um, Descartes allows dreaming to count as a species of perception. You could use the term that way. I'm not going to use the term that way. I'm going to use it just in the more restricted success sense. So with this restricted understanding of what ways of knowing are uh, in hand, my proposal is the justifying basis of a person's knowledge of a fact, um, what it is that makes that um, propositional attitude of acceptance, except it epistemically right, actually even optimal, um, is nothing other than the way it's known. So beliefs that fall short of knowledge actually um, could still have some degree of justification. Um, for, the, for example, in the extent to which um, the ways in which they're formed approximate ways of knowing. Um, but for something to be fully justified, in my view, uh, it, needs to, uh, it needs to be the product of a way of knowing where ways of knowing are understood in this infallibilist sense. Um, so there's, there's a long tradition in the history of philosophy for this kind of infallibilism, um, most clearly in the classical Indian Nyaya tradition. Um, one thing I love about the Nyaya tradition is they, they, define, they identify inference, testimony, and perception um, as ways of knowing. And they say, you know what? What you really have in hallucination is pseudo-perception. Um, what you really have, uh, if someone tells you something and you take it to be knowledgeable testimony, and it's not, um, that's actually pseudo-testimony. Uh, it's not real testimony. Real testimony has to be from a knower. Uh, misinformation is pseudo-testimony. It's fake news. Um, any less than sound inference is pseudo-inference. Even if what you're doing is 
uh, executing a logically valid inference, which includes one false premise. Um, they classify that not as inference, but as pseudo-inference. The only genuine inference they want to say is sound inference from known premises. So I kind of I like that way of, um, uh, of uh, understanding what inference, testimony, and perception really are. Um, they're, they are, uh, I think, best understood as ways of knowing. And, uh, and although we, of course, casually describe invalid inferences as, as inferences, um, they're not inferences in the proper uh, epistemological sense. This is ex very much a minority view in contemporary epistemology. So contemporary epistemologists are virtually all fallibilists, some exceptions, uh, in this room. Um, uh, but here's what the fallibilists commonly say about the justifying basis of, uh, of what's known. I want to focus for a little while on just looking at the justification of knowledge, and then we'll also look more at the justification of belief. So um, according to Baron Reed, uh, the big idea, the, the fundamental idea of fallibilism is the following. Quote, a belief held with a particular epistemic grounding can be knowledge, even though the subject could have held that belief with the same grounding in circumstances where the belief is false. So that's <coughs> fallibilism. A lot of people say you have to be a fallibilist or uh, it's going to be impossible for you to grant that there's knowledge of the external world for reasons that we'll see in a minute. According to fallibilists, false beliefs can have exactly the same epistemic grounding. And they also use often interchangeably the idea of justification here with grounding. Uh, false beliefs can have exactly the same epistemic grounding as instances of knowledge. So epistemic grounding in cases where P is known on this kind of fallibilist picture can't be understood in a way which makes the truth of P essential to one's epistemic grounding for P. So fallibilism, I gave you, gave you sort of epistemic grounding formulation. It can also be formulated in terms of justification. So um, Reed's formulation in that way is a person S knows that P in a fallibilist way just in case S knows that P on the basis of some justification J, and yet S's belief that P on the basis of J could have been false or mistaken or in error. Um, he actually, he, he goes on to amend that slightly because he's got to take account of cases in which someone believes a necessary truth in a way that's falling short of knowledge. But we're going to set aside those complications for, for the moment. Um, so number 12 on your handout, Barry gives a kind of example of this. And this at first sounds so intuitive. It sounds so right. It's really hard to resist. Um, here's, here's this example. For example, I know that the Cubs beat the Dodgers, these are baseball teams, the last time they played. I know it because my brother told me what happened, and he's usually reliable about this sort of thing. But if he had misread the box score in the newspaper, I still would have believed him. In that case, my belief would have been held with the same justification, but the belief would have been false. Um, because, because this case is possible, the knowledge that I actually have when my brother didn't, re didn't misread the box score is fallible. OK. So that's his example. And it seems really compelling. Yeah, of course, he would have believed him, even if he made a mistake. Um, I take this to be, um, to, to make it simple, I take this to be a case of testimonial knowledge transmission. That is, that Barron, uh, insofar as he's saying he does gain knowledge in a good case from his brother telling him, sounds like he's gaining knowledge because he's taking his brother at, at his word. Not like he's kind of calculating, oh, my brother's right 94.7% of the time, and he's just told me that the Cubs won. So, Because if the, if, if the subject were thinking in that kind of inferential way, um, then actually, for him to really have, it looks like what he really have knowledge of is, um, uh, is something a little weaker than just the claim, yeah, the Cubs won. Uh, if you're thinking in that very precise inferential way, uh, he's, my brother is usually reliable, and he told me that the Cubs won, therefore, inferentially, what you should conclude is it's highly likely that the Cubs won. You shouldn't just go for, yeah, so the Cubs won. That's actually making a little bit of a mistake. But it's totally fine uh, if this is an ordinary case of testimonial knowledge transmission, and he's taking his brother's word for it. Um, totally fine for him to be gaining knowledge in that way. 
Um, there is something that I agree with Baron is the same in the good case and the bad case, and it's the following. Um, if you challenge the subject, Colleen Barron, in either of these two cases, what he can say or how he can report how he made the judgment is exactly the same. If you say, hey, why do you believe that the Cubs won? You catch him later, and he's like, oh, my brother told me, right? He's going to say exactly the same thing uh, in both of these cases. What he can report on about the epistemic basis of his judgment is exactly the same in the two cases. And notice we have some exposure to what kind of basis we have for his claim. Your feeling about the Cubs' victory is different if you were actually in the stadium watching them win versus if your brother just told you about it, right? And that is something that is reportable for you. Um, those things are the same, what you can see about your own epistemic basis consciously. There's something that's different in the two cases, though. Um, what's really different is the actual causal story linking the outcome of this baseball game to the subject's judgment about it, right? In the one case uh, where the brother misreads the score, uh, the Cubs actually lost, he gets the columns mixed up, tells his brother that he won. Something different happens in that case versus the case where, uh, where things go well. Um, misreading is not a way of knowing. And something has happened problematically in the external causal chain between the outcome of the game uh, and the formation of the subject's belief uh, in the misreading case. That's very different from what went well in the case uh, when, uh, when knowledge was transmitted. What did happen when knowledge was transmitted? Well, we usually think there was a reporter at the game who had perceptual and inferential awareness of the game's outcome and reported it through reliable channels, which were picked up um, by an appropriately trusting brother uh, who then transmits what he has come to know testimonially to his brother. This is actually not even just a case of testimonial knowledge transmission. It's secondhand testimonial knowledge transmission. I'm not skeptical about it, but for me, the epistemic justification of this belief um, lies in the connection between the real world fact about what happened in that baseball stadium and the formation of the judgment, um, not in what the subject can report about the formation of the judgment. Okay, so that's, um, uh, that's uh, me as an infallible externalist uh, versus, uh, versus Baron Reed. Um, but now I want to I address uh, what I think is the strongest kind of objection against this picture, and it's something due to Roger White. Okay. So Roger White is um, an internalist, brilliant internalist. He uh, advocates a Cartesian conception of evidence uh, in which, um, for example, quote, the evidence I gain from visual experience consists in information about how things visually appear to me. Um, so that's the kind of internalism we're seeing in people like, uh, like Schiffer as well. Uh, and he contrasts his view with a view like Williamson's, that sort of evidence externalism in which um, the evidence you're gaining from visual experience goes beyond information about how things visually appear to me and can include facts about how things are in my environment. So remember in Williamson's case, uh, evidence equals knowledge. You gain perceptual knowledge you know, through the operation of your sensory systems looking out at the world. Um, you can, if you want, also get introspective and gain some knowledge about how things visually appear to you um, but usually you're, you know, first just conscious of outer things in the world. Um, so it's part of, it's, it's, it's included in your evidence that, that, things are, that things are a certain way when you have perceptual evidence of the fact. Okay, um, so one of the kind of weird things that Williamson has to do, any evidence externalist has to do, is he has to deny um, that, uh, it, that, hallucinators and perceivers have the same evidence. So you might think that if I'm actually seeing my hand or I'm just having a really vivid dream that I'm seeing my hand, I've got exactly the same evidence to work with. And the evidence externalist has to deny that. Um, if, 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 if he's like Williamson, in the case where you are actually seeing your hand, 
Um, your evidence includes the fact that your hand is there. That's something that you're becoming aware of through perception. If you're just dreaming that you're seeing your hand uh, and your hand isn't there, maybe your hands have been, uh, have been chopped off and you're, uh, you're in a coma at the hospital uh, and you're having that very vivid dream of looking at your hand, um, you do not have evidence that your hand is there. Your evidence is just different. Um, so, uh, so in the good and bad case, uh, you've got different evidence. If you're an evidence externalist, in the good case, your evidence includes, uh, now I'm quoting White, a kind of direct epistemic access and presence of the hand before me. Um, so then White lays out this very kind of bizarre, science fiction-y, but um, valuable case in which um, someone's actually looking at their hand, but they've been given really, really interesting De detailed and highly persuasive evidence that they're hallucinating. Uh, and, and so, so, you know, let's say they've, um, they've been given uh, all, all kinds of testimony that they've ingested a drug that induces illusions as of hands. Um, they haven't actually, but, um, but you know, the world's foremost scientist on pharmacological hallucinations uh, comes to them and gives them a lecture and um, they're shown, you know, videos of having ingested a drug or something like that. Let's say the videos are fake and the, and the scientist is a fraud, but, um, but it all looks incredibly, incredibly persuasive. Um, okay. Uh, so, Here's the question. This person who's been given all kinds of reasons to believe that actually you're hallucinating, um, that's not your hand. Uh, is he justified in just still saying, yeah, no, my hand is there, um, or not? Um, it looks like, actually, I think this particular case is not the strongest case of its type. There could, be, there could be cases which are a bit less than plausible. But let's just roll with this and say, yeah, it feels like it's it's not totally justified for the person to say, oh no, my hand is there, after they've been given all kinds of evidence that suggests that they are, uh, they are hallucinating. If the evidence externalist agrees that the misleading evidence renders the subject unable to have a justified belief that there's a hand before them, this is still Roger White, then she will need to explain how the subject's direct epistemic access to outer world facts has disappeared. So if, you, if you're still looking at your hand, but you, now you're not justified, what happened to your evidence? So here's how Roger White presses the challenge. First, why is it that misleading evidence that I'm hallucinating robs me of this extra evidence, the direct access to the world? Nothing appears to have changed about my perceptual state and connection to the world. Suppose I even go on dogmatically thinking, here's a hand despite the mounting evidence that I'm hallucinating, I'm at least still seeing my hand. Like they haven't chopped off his hand. His hand is still there, he's still looking at it. My eyes are still receiving accurate information from the world. My belief forming mechanisms are operating as usual and forming a true belief. Isn't that enough to have direct per perceptual access to the layout of my environment? I also happen to have some misleading evidence that this isn't so, which I'm blithely ignoring. But it's hard to see how my possession of such evidence changes my perceptual state in such a way as to rob me of my direct perceptual access to the world. This is a really powerful challenge to that kind of externalism. And I think Wright is absolutely, uh, White is absolutely right uh, to observe that nothing in the subject's eyes or environment needs to change as he takes all that misleading evidence on board and hears about how he was given a drug, which he wasn't actually given. What's controversial in, what, in Roger White's presentation is the claim that my belief forming mechanisms are operating as usual in forming a true belief. Um, as the subject dogmatically affirms, here's a hand, despite all the mounting evidence to the contrary. Um, by the description of the case, actually, the subject isn't engaging exactly the same belief forming mechanisms on the questions of his hand's presence before and after he registers the misleading evidence. In the original and naive perceptual judgment, the subject's just immediately conscious of his hand. The externalist epistemologist's detailed account of the basis of this belief can describe the subject's relationship to her environment, citing such factors as the proper functioning of her visual capacity as the safely true production of this non-inferential judgment. You just start out. Um, you don't infer. You just look at your hand, and you're aware that it's there, right? 
to generate the impression that the subject's belief is defeated, uh, that it's no longer justified. Notice that it's important that the subject has a properly first personal present tense recognition of the bearing of the misleading evidence on the judgment um, that he's being asked to make. Um, so in coming to understand his new evidence, oh, it's me that you're saying was given that hallucinatory drug? Wow. Um, just in the process of coming to understand the evidence, he has to entertain the possibility um, that what he has is a hallucination as opposed to a real hand, right? He's opened the question of whether his hand is really before him or not. He's consciously entertained um, this possibility. If you imagine him then as just blithely ignoring the possibility, dogmatically judging, here's a hand, um, this deliberate evasion of evidence actually is part of the complete belief forming process now sustaining his belief. What's happened is that by becoming self conscious about this hypothetical possibility, he's been forced to switch into inferential judgment uh, on the question of what is before him now. And he's actually making an unsound inferential judgment uh, as opposed to a sound perceptual one. So, um, giving people misleading evidence about their own epistemic predicament can switch them into uh, an inferential way of thinking uh, and out of the uh, uh, naive, non-inferential way of thinking. It's actually sort of higher order versions of this problem. Um, you can create defeat problems even in cases of inferential thinking. Um, I think you perform actually a variation of the same, uh, of the same kind of maneuver to handle, those, uh, to handle those cases as well. Uh, but it gets more complicated, so I'm not going to get into it uh, immediately. If you look at page 4, uh, 16 on your handout, here's the basic idea um, that, I'm trying to, um, that I'm trying to push here. We've got certain conscious models of the world um, that guide action. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm able to successfully reach for the bottle here um, because I have conscious awareness of it being there. Um, our conscious models of the world actually also guide communicative action. Uh, I'm able to tell you things because I, I'm aware of you as not knowing them, or I think that you don't know them, and sometimes you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, or to ask you things because I'm aware of you as knowing them. Uh, so so conscious, conscious models of epistemic standing, in particular, um, guide our communicative actions. Um, they enable us to make changes in how we're thinking. Uh, for example, by shifting from unreflective judgment to more cautious modes of thought. And that's something we do not only in conversation, it's something we do also if we start to have private doubts about claims that we're making, beliefs that we have, states of affairs in the world. Um, because reflective epistemology, where you get self-conscious about your epistemic standing, directs your attention onto your conscious models of epistemic standing, um, it can generate the illusion that justification can only ever be cautious. Um, but I think that's a, uh, that's a mistake. What we're actually doing uh, when we start to get cautious is we're starting to worry about our epistemic standing, and we're not inhabiting our original epistemic standing um, the way that we were um, before we started raising the questions. Um, so I'm going to just leave you with a question at the end, which is a question about the relationship between justification and the specifically active exercise of epistemic agency. If you think back to the example that Barron gave us of the good and the bad case of the baseball victory, the case in which um, the game was won and your brother knew that it was and he told you so and you believed him and you came to know that it was won, and the case in which the game was lost but your brother misread the score uh, and you ended up with a false belief. In both of these cases, from your subject's perspective, your brother comes in and he tells you exactly the same thing. Hey, the Cubs won last night. And you're like, oh, great. Uh, and you update your belief. What you did as a subject is exactly the same in those two cases, good case and bad case. Um, you didn't do anything bad in the bad case. You didn't do anything bad. You didn't actively exercise your epistemic agency. Uh, in a way that you could be faulted for. Nevertheless, in the bad case, something bad happened. Looking at this from a God's eye perspective, 
uh, you ended up with a false belief. Something epistemically bad happened. It could, of course, be practically good to you know, believe that your team had won. Maybe you get a, a momentary joy out of that. But, um, but looking down on the whole situation from above, something happened that wasn't great. Um, but uh, the problem there was something that you suffered passively, not something that you did actively. Uh, and I think this kind of observation has a lot to do with how internalists think about justification. Um, they think about justification in terms of, uh, have you been responsible? Have you exercised your active epistemic agency uh, in a way that was appropriate? What did you do wrong? Um, but I think if you retreat to a different understanding of justification, a more externalist understanding of justification says, what is justification? Justification is a measure of whether it's normatively right, OK, or good um, to believe something. That's not just a function of how you have been actively um, deploying your epistemic agency. Uh, it's also a function of how things have been going for you in your passivity. That is, um, even in cases where, uh, uh, it, that is, there's something normatively uh, problematic or wrong or off when people end up with uh, false beliefs. Even when it's not their fault they didn't do anything wrong, they unwittingly ingested a drug which made them hallucinate. Um, they didn't. Uh, they didn't. They didn't do anything. They didn't do anything bad. They suffered something. Um, and on the externalist approach, um, part of what constitutes justification is uh, is housed in the structure of our passivity and our receptivity. And uh, and so 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 it matters to have a good epistemic standing, not just that you uh, do a good job and don't commit any. Uh, active epistemic crimes, um, but it matters also that you uh, inhabit a certain kind of environment and, uh, and have um, appropriate connections to the world around you, uh, even when these connections are not ultimately of your own making. Thank you. Uh, so, Ms. Christopher Southern, maybe because it's con my question concerns a very early part of okay, uh, number 2.2. Yeah. So, basic types of noise. Uh, some, some people think that perception is also inferential. Yes. So, it's actually, I mean, in philosophy, but also yeah. I feel in psychology, like, people Absolutely. really don't feel any like, concerns when they speak yeah. of inference in that context, in terms yeah. of perception. So I'm wondering what's your take on that to like just reject this conception or is does your is your conception of differential knowledge about explicit or conscious inference? Because usually when psychologists talk about yeah. perception of inferential then it's about unconscious So um, so I think absolutely perception is subpersonally inferential. I have no problem with that at all. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I am. Uh, I am distinguishing between conscious and unconscious inference. That's that's correct. So I want to classify something as um, as inf inferential in my sense only if there's some explicit conscious contemplation of uh, of premises. I think actually even in inferential reasoning, we're typically not aware of like all the supporting considerations um, behind our. Uh, behind our judgment, but we have to be aware of something for me to classify to classify this as, as inferential. Um, so yeah, that's good question, good clarification. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't understand why the evidence externalist has to accept that um, um, that there is indeed misleading evidence that one is merely hallucinating. Why doesn't it just deny that that's actually a piece of evidence? Uh, okay, it depends what you mean by misleading evidence. Uh, there could be something that you know to be the case, which uh, you, you can't have something which you know to be the case which um, demonstrates or, or establishes something false. 
Um, but you could have something that you know to be the case that makes it quite likely. Uh, uh, I like that 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 something that something is false. So, so mis misleading is you know misleading relative to various background beliefs that you have, some of which might not themselves be knowledge. Um, uh, you can have you can. You can discover somebody who wasn't, in fact, the killer near the crime scene with blood on their hands, right? And, uh, and, and you now know that the butler was standing right there with blood on his hands, and that can sure make it look bad for the butler. It can sure make it likely, given various background beliefs you might have, that, uh, that the butler is the killer, even if he wasn't, right? I think that's, that's relative. That's relatively uncontroversial. You will not have misleading evidence that demonstrates for you so that that um, that you are hallucinating. Absolutely, that's that's real. That's real. Yeah, sorry. Just that for a, for an police like you. Yes. You shouldn't count that as evidence. Like, oh, uh, well, it depends what it depends what the evidence is, right? So I would want to be very, very careful in my description, which might be a little different from Roger White's description of the scenario. So in my description of the scenario, um, what you learn is not that you have been given a drug which makes you hallucinate hands. What you learn is that someone enters the room and tells you the following story. You know, that's so you learn something that's like a little bit out of the loop. Um, but if you can elaborate the case in enough detail, you could certainly make it um, completely reasonable for the subject to conclude, oh gosh, I guess I, I could be hallucinating. I guess I don't know that my hand is here. I, I, can, I can absolutely buy that um, line of thought in, in, in White's case. So this, in my view, this is a case in which knowledge isn't exactly defeated. It is, uh, it is undermined. Uh, it, it, in the sense that it's uh, it, it, it's um, it's lost, it's 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 erased. It's lost not through a process of forgetting, but through a process of being forced to switch to a different way of thinking about the matter, which no longer affords you a path to the truth um, that's mm -hmm. safe and sound. Um. So I was at, with point 12 in Baron Reed's quotation about. Yeah. So I mean, I was just wondering whether one needs to accept that what the subject can report about how he made his judgment is the same in the two cases. Okay. Uh, so there's this embedded question. Uh, so I know it because my brother told me what happened. Yeah. But he didn't tell you what happened. It, it didn't yeah. happen. Right? So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering whether one doesn't need to get a gap between the causal mechanism and the descriptions of of the, form, the way in which the person formed the judgment, um, because these embedded questions frequently entail that what was told to you was correct. Um, and in that case, yeah, then the description would have to be different. Either. Yeah, I actually think it's a little bit uh, a little bit of a failing on Reed's part in his construction of the example that he set it up with, because my brother told me what happened. As, and that is being presented as if that is the basis of the two cases. I think that's a slip on Reed's part uh, Reed should have put, um, because my brother said the Cubs won, right. and he's usually reliable about those, about those things. But yes, absolutely good to spot it. And I think it's actually quite telling that he wrote it that way, right? Because in fact, that is how, uh, that is how we defend ourselves when we're challenged on a line of testimonial knowledge. The Cubs won. Oh, how come? Uh, how can you think that? Uh, how do you know that? How do you know that they won? You'll say, my brother told me. I won't say, well, my brother said that they did. Right. That seems like a little and bit of a weakness, a little bit of a step back, a little bit yeah. of a disavowal. And then if it, if it was the other description, yeah. then people might be less inclined to think that they really did know when they said Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think, uh, I think that's yeah, very, very perceptive observation. Um, so I, I guess I'm just kind of curious for more information about something you said close to start in okay. basic type development yes. as well. So you mentioned that. Curiously, memory is not on your list yeah. before because memory is kind of, at least in the background of all of them, in yeah. terms of like priors or yeah. unconscious reasoning or something like that. But I'm curious, where does, I think I might know the answer, but like, where does memory fit when we're doing conscious, explicit memory based, re like, when I'm consciously trying to remember something, I bring it up to my mind's eye and yes. use that to. Yes. 
gain knowledge that I had again or something like that. So is that inferential or is that perceptual? So I'm just curious, like, not the background in all, but the ex background in memory, but the explicit times we use memory, how, how we ought to treat that. I mean, I think it can depend a bit on what the question is that you are trying to answer. Um, so if it's a question about a past event and what you are retrieving is just pure episodic memory, um, then I would want to say that that, that would be, uh, that would usually be um, uh, ultimately a class of perceptually based okay. judgment, uh, something that you perceived in the past and you are reviving it. I think it's actually like it's a, that's actually it's a difficult and complicated question because um, you know it can be tempting to think of memory as just you know uh, a recorder which has some kind of automatic playback and the truth about it is is much more difficult and much more complicated than that. Um, but uh, but there could be other types of memory, um, semantic memory, you're remembering things that you learned in school, uh, what was the date at the Battle of Hastings. Um, uh, that's going to be testimonial in character. Uh, so, uh, but but I do I do I do recognize the um, the operation of memory is fascinating and epistemically pretty compl complicated. Uh, and it may be that actually there's certain situations in which we trust our memory and we shouldn't. Um, that memory might not always be what it seems to be. I think ultimately the epistemic standing of the morally bounded of, of beliefs that um, are revived to us at the moment through memory um, is, going to, uh, is going to depend not just on characteristics of the original moment of acquisition, but also characteristics of our systems for storage and retrieval over time. Um, and that's a very complicated, uh, complicated psychological question. Um, but what really matters is whether there is something about that way of having, for example, witnessed something yesterday and episodically remembering it now. Um, if there is something about that whole chain which makes it the case that you wouldn't be judging in the way that you are now if it weren't for the fact that um, this really did happen. Um, I have a follow-up. Um, so, like, um, I think you already answered this, but I'm a little confused. So when you gain knowledge again, Yes. Is that really like a type of knowledge gaining um, like process like the other four? Like in the sense that um, reviving your memory, I mean, your knowledge is not the same as gaining it. Yeah, yeah. right. So right. in that sense, it, it, I mean, it doesn't make sense to have it as like a yeah. separate... Yeah, Thanks. that's that's right. That's right. I, I'm sorry. I should I should not have said knowledge gain a second. I should have said knowledge revival, revival to current awareness. Yes, you're you're absolutely right. That um, that that it's not a it's not a second. This is just something that popped in my brain about like. So you mentioned at the start like, oh, in evidential languages, this four-way split shows up a lot, or there's a two-way yeah. split that does it. So I'm just thinking of like the evidential languages that I know of in their split, and yeah. memory is one of the weird ones that doesn't always fall into yeah. the perceptual or the non-perceptual, it kind of shows up yeah, all over I, the place. I think that's because yeah. it's either you're remembering an episode or you're yeah. remembering a fact that you were... Uh, yeah, but that's at least like at least some that yeah. like... Memory that. Yeah, And just like on that like evidential thing, you mentioned that like, oh, Descartes put dreams in terms of perception. At least yeah. in evidential languages, there's not a single one that I know of that ever puts contents of dreams into the perceptual, they're all, yeah. if there is a hearsay, it's all art, they're always a hearsay, they're all, and they're not even, I don't even know of one that puts them, that splits inferential versus hearsay, that puts them in inferential, they're always like, at the same level of completely, potentially unreliable, informant mm -hmm. type of deal, so. Oh, okay, yeah. thanks for that. That's great. Can I squeeze in one question? In this point 15, you, when you say that, that the person might start consciously entertaining that something has gone wrong, or the sense of first person recognition, and that it's kind of a, you present this as sort of an externalist account, right? But my worry was whether that's could an externalist actually say that, because it seems to be those are like internalist defeaters, right? Um, so the externalist does not have to deny the causal significance of the first-person point of view. 
Um, so there's sometimes a tendency to think of externalism as just being about physical processes that are playing out um, outside of the subject or at the subpersonal level within the subject, these cognitive mechanisms. Um, the externalist can absolutely allow that conscious awareness of something can have its own distinctive causal impact on um, the subject's belief formation. Right? So you've just made me consciously aware of a scenario in which um, there isn't a water bottle there, there's no elaborate hologram that you've rigged up to present the appearance of a water bottle there. Um, you having done that, um, you've put me in a different, you've activated different cognitive mechanisms within me and you've put me in a different um, epistemic position. What I judge now to be the case is partly a function of the new contents of my conscious awareness. Um, so, I mean, one of the things you can do if people start, you know, uh, getting you worried about, uh, about hallucination is, um, you know, they're, they're sort of making certain things very vivid for you in, in working memory. If you wait a while and go about your daily life and get to the place where you've sort of forgotten those worries, um, then you can go back to making sort of naive, non-inferential judgments. But, but, um, but you're right to point out that there is something uh, essentially first person there. It's just something that can also, from the externalist perspective, have a distinctive role uh, in our belief formation. And I think, um, yeah, one of the things that's going on here is that the internalist is making you very consciously aware of certain problematic possibilities for your, um, uh, for your method of belief formation. That's something we usually do when we're setting about to change our method of belief formation, to try and rethink an issue. Um, and, but that's something you can do, even if there wasn't anything wrong with, um, like White is very clear, like there wasn't anything, any mistake that the subject was making initially when they looked at their hand and said, oh, there's a hand there, right? But you just gave them the impression that they could think about that in a different way. And by doing so, you started making them think about it. But you mentioned this, that the role that these uh, thoughts play actually are, is, is like a causal role, thing. Right? Yes. But they also, uh, they also have an epistemic role. Mm -hmm. so they, mm -hmm. The role is like being a defeater. So. Right, right. Role. So for the, for the externalist, um, a causal role is an epistemic role. That's what it is to, uh, to have uh, an epistemic role or a justificatory role, is to, uh, there's, the, we, don't, we don't maintain a distinction between those things. Mm -hmm. Brian, you look so puzzled. <laughs> well, okay, I do have one question. Yes. I actually have a hard time sometimes getting excited about issues about externalism and internals when we start the evidence or justification because I think that those words, justification and evidence, although they're like have enough meaning so that when you put them in certain sentences you get truth values, it seems to me they don't have enough meaning to settle these disputes about whether you know justification is internal or external. I mean you can offer a persistification so it comes out internal, that's beautiful. You can offer a different one so it comes out external, that's beautiful too. But I don't really see much in the way of there being a fact of the matter ahead of time. It's more like you can offer what I just said. We can yeah. offer persistification so that it comes out that externalism is true, but you can offer different ones so it comes out internalism is true, and there's no conflict there because you offer different persistification. Uh, okay. Um, one thing I'm absolutely going to grant to you is that these are somewhat technical terms. And so what I mean by evidence, what Roger White means by evidence, those don't line up. And I'm going to have to argue that I've got the superior conception. Um, you seem to be much happier with epistemology than I am, in a sense. If you're saying, oh, yeah, you can persistify it that way, and that's fine. You can persistify it that way, and it's that fine. I think if you persistify the notion of evidence or justification in the internalist way, you get something that's ultimately incoherent uh, and, uh, and unsatisfactory. And I don't think that's true if you, if you maintain, I think you can consistently maintain uh, a clean externalism all the way down the line. Uh, I think there is some pre-theoretical understanding of evidence and justification, which is grounded in our natural, social, epistemically interactive practices with each other. We challenge each other. 
What do you mean? Uh, and I think a lot of the challenges are perfectly legitimate and constructive and helpful. Right? And there's lots of cases where you should be skeptical and you should challenge people. You should challenge people if they start telling you that vaccines cause autism or that global warming isn't real. Um, you should be absolutely skeptical of those claims and it's very constructive to do that. So I think there is a pre-theoretical understanding of what evidence do you have? Can you justify yourself? And that's grounded in our ordinary social practices. Um, I'm so glad you asked this question. Um, but I think, I think then, um, the ordinary social, natural understanding of evidence and justification um, is something that can sometimes look a little bit strange when you drag it under the uh, epistemologist's microscope. Um, because the ordinary social, natural notion of evidence and justification um, emerges for certain ordinary social and natural purposes related to the transmission or sharing of knowledge. Uh, and these purposes are slightly different from um, the objective pre-existing facts about the possession of knowledge. So I think it's really easy to look at, um, uh, to look at epistemic justification, uh, to look at it through the lens of, what do we do when we get challenged on our epistemic standing? Oh, we go through these maneuvers. And you can just sort of say naively, okay, so the maneuvers themselves, those are what constitute um, justification. And I think if you, if you, if you just do that, um, you end up with the incoherent internalist position. Do you mean um, like you, if you wrote down the internalist thesis, you could draw a contradiction? Is that what you mean by incoherent? No, but people. I think you could I think you could derive something that's gonna be uh, that's gonna be uh, manifestly unsatisfactory. Um, it may require, for me to really establish that it's manifestly unsatisfactory, um, it may require premises which a skeptic would not be happy to accept. Um, so there's one premise which I think the skeptic does kind of want to accept, um, which is that knowledge is in some sense better than ignorance. If you're a kind of skeptic who doesn't even grant that, I'm not sure I can. Uh, I'm not sure I can get get anywhere with you. Um, if you think that in order to have knowledge, um, someone needs to be justified, justification is a mark of some kind of positive epistemic standing. Um, then, uh, then I think we can we can get going. We can start. Uh, we can start to make progress. If you have no distinction between negative and positive epistemic standing, if you're like some kind of epistemological nihilist, um, or you think, yeah, justification is a bad thing, then, um, then you've got some kind of inverted position which, uh, which might be very hard to, hard to argue with. I think our fundamental pre-theoretical concepts of uh, evidence and justification are driven by a sense that knowledge is a good, that it is worthy of pursuit, um, there is such a thing as having a better or worse epistemic standing. Uh, and then we can look at our natural mechanisms for enhancing our epistemic standing. And we can look at the, some of the limitations of the natural mechanisms that we have for detecting sound epistemic standing. Um, so you can, um, if you're worried about someone's epistemic standing, challenge them to argument. But that doesn't go to show that the only thing that constitutes a good epistemic standing is the possession of a strong argument. I think it's pretty clear that there are cases, like cases of naive perceptual knowledge in which you could be very um, poorly positioned to argue, but still in a fine, uh, a fine epistemic position. So I think that's a follow-up. Okay. So I don't have any strong commitments in this internal external debate myself, yeah. unfortunately. So I was curious what to think about this way of reconciliating them by like, claiming that taking these different types of knowledge and then we can talk about different types of justification as well. So at least I am not committed to this, but it's a bit intuitive to think of like in case of interoceptive knowledge and perception knowledge, the justification they are being like internalist maybe. Like there's like percep facts about perceptual appearances and, and uh, interoceptive States are more like uh, accessible, so to speak, for a for subject, and then like maybe uh, inferential justification and maybe testimonial justification being more like externalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can see feeling that there is uh, 
that there is a contrast there. Um, and I think um, no, I think this can have I think this actually relates in sort of an interesting way to um, what people say about the function of consciousness within the predictive processing framework, right? That one of the sort of key things about having this first person conscious perspective on reality. Uh, is that it's going to guide action. Uh, you can exercise some control when you have perceptual knowledge of what is in front of you right now. You can actually exercise some control over how you're perceiving it. You can, you can move your head from side to side and, and really um, play around with, uh, with the um, aspect of the object that you want to you want to investigate. You can sort of actively interrogate it uh, in certain ways. It's a little harder to do that with um, testimonial knowledge, although if the person's right there, you can try interrogating them. Um, so I do, I do think I do think there can be some some interesting uh, interesting differences uh, in these in these types of knowledge. And some of them do seem to lend themselves more naturally to uh, framework which prioritizes the perspective of the first person. There's something else I feel like I have to say about sort of the perspective of the first person, though, that, um, that one of the ways in which a completely internalist outlook can end up feeling like it's not what we're looking for um, is, you know, if you think of somebody who's got sort of very elaborate conspiracy theory and about like all the different pieces which kind of fit together and from within the their own headspace, everything makes so much sense, right? But if it doesn't, uh, it, you know, if it's like sort of fundamentally, causally out of line with reality, we do want to say there's something epistemically problematic about it. Even if they can construct all these sort of internal, uh, internal arguments between various different things that they believe, um, if, if, if those beliefs were initially generated by causally unreliable sources or by uh, you know, hallucination or, or, or delusion, even if it's no fault of their own, uh, it feels like there's something epistemically problematic about that. And I think externalism is much better to, positioned to capture um, the kind of problem that we get in those cases. Yeah, so, um, this is on, it's under 10 on this, the ways of knowing. Yes. So, um, in this kind of way of knowing, inference isn't a way of knowing, but sound inference from known premises is. Yes. So there's something about this that kind of struck me along the lines of like um, the generality debate within reliabilism about Absolutely. like how Absolutely. are we supposed yes. to properly cash out or yeah. know how to cash out the ways of knowing versus the not ways of yeah. knowing. Is there a natural thing? It's like, well look within the world the processes that actually are reliably connected to knowledge producing states or so yeah. I'm just curious about like how do we figure out or like what are the null the ways of knowing versus things that look very similar but might not be ways of knowing. Right. So the the reliableists are usually fallibleists. They yeah. usually have a weaker position than the one that I'm trying to maintain. Um, so the reliableists will say you have knowledge if you have um, a generally reliable um, cognitive mechanism and your judgment is true. And then a lot of them end up having to have no defeater conditions and various other ad hoc patches thrown in there to get them out of troublesome counter examples. Um, and yeah, I want, to, uh, I want to go for something, uh, something much uh, stronger than that. Um, one of the things I'm not going to try to do is give some kind of reductive analysis of knowing into um, the capacity to form beliefs plus a bunch of other factors. So I think if you, uh, if you insist on the idea that knowing or having a state of mind which, is a, which essentially grasps the truth, which essentially reflects how things are, um, if you think that that's the primitive, that that's the fundamental representational concept, then that takes some pressure off demands for um, you know, giving some kind of analysis. I, I mean, yeah, it's a good question how we identify these uh, ways of knowing. We do seem to um, we do seem to recognize them, like in languages which have fact of verbs, like you know, he sees that the barn is on fire. We take it to be the case. Uh, maybe here we are um, uh, you know, we are projecting, we're reaching, we're sticking our neck out when you say that somebody uh, sees that something's the case. When I say that you see that this um, bottle is right here, um, I am 
if you like, slightly going beyond the very slim sliver of ambiguous evidence that I have about you and your sight line to make that very bold judgment. But that's, um, that's a judgment that, uh, uh, that you know, could, abs could absolutely be right. It could have um, uh, you know, uh, great uh, predictive power, uh, as we said yesterday. Let me ask again, uh, I have a question about the big picture. Yes. I mean, you've been giving here uh, five lectures about mind reading, active mental states, epistemic territory, innovation analysis, now about knowledge, and then skepticism. And I, I kind of see that there is some sort of common thread, but maybe you can explain it. describe yourself. So, what is that? How do these all hang together? Is, what's that? Uniting or the main, the main idea that brings them together. Okay. So, I suppose. Um, one might think of epistemology as a very, very academic exercise. Uh, it is uh, something quite rarefied and artificial and abstract. Uh, I think it's also, for me, something that's evidently uh, a, a huge part of the human condition, not this necessarily reflective exercise of trying to uh, you know, think very carefully about what we're doing when we draw a line between knowing and failing to know. Uh, but, but what we're actually doing in practice all the time when we say that someone knows what's going on or that they think this is the case, we do seem in our ordinary, everyday social lives to spend a great deal of time distinguishing between what people do and don't know. We use these verbs attributing knowledge or belief very heavily in all natural languages. It's part of our existence as social, cooperative, interactive animals. Uh, that we're the kind of animal that knows the difference between knowing something and just thinking it to be the case. And, um, you know, we can feel outrage at somebody who's a liar, or even more somebody who's kind of a bullshitter and just saying things that they don't, uh, they don't even care about whether it's true or false. Um, I think we've got, we've got a strong sense that knowledge is something valuable, that knowledge is something important. Um, and... And I think it's easy to sort of despair of academic exercises to, you know, probe the nature of knowledge because a lot of academic epistemology can end up very quickly um, making knowledge something very, very, you know, complicated and abstruse. And maybe you feel that, uh, that, that my sort of position ends up doing, doing that as well. Uh, or it can make you feel like, uh, wow, I guess... Knowledge is really, really hard to attain. Maybe human beings never quite satisfy all the conditions in this crazy, like, 17-point definition of what knowledge has to be. Um, I think knowledge is actually common and readily available, typically within our grasp. You know, we see things in the world around us, and uh, uh, and we know that uh, we know that they're so. Um, we have certain natural. Uh, epistemic weaknesses and failings, uh, which we can also discover. Uh, I think we have some natural epistemic weaknesses and failings exactly around um, uh, our capacity to spot knowledge in ourselves and in other people. And my hope is that a really good systematic epistemology can help us achieve better self-understanding of what we're doing when we attribute uh, knowledge or when we see people as failing to know, which is something we're doing all the time as part of our natural social existence. Um, so, so I feel like there is a sort of groundedness in epistemology that I'm trying to explore in this series of lectures. Thank you. Thank you.